Did any of you ever have a CB radio? Yeah. A couple of back in the day when they were popular. Um, you still have one? Okay, good. Um, my dad and I and hunting buddies and relatives would go hunting. We had CB radios in all our trucks. And back in the day when CBs were popular, if you had a CB, you also had a CB handle. A CB handle. Okay, that's the name that you had when you were talking to people on the radio. You didn't call yourself Mike or George. You had a handle. My dad's CB handle was Rattlesnake. Uh, my uncle's handle was the pot liquor. I was Gandalf. <laughs> Gandalf. Uh, we had a friend, a hunting buddy, who actually used to attend this church. His CB handle was Gideon. Gideon. Does anyone know who I'm talking about, by the way? Good, I can talk about him. Uh, <laughs> When I, I was just a kid, and I asked him, so why, why did you choose Gideon as your CB handle? He says, well, in the Bible, Gideon is called a mighty warrior. And uh, he had experienced some difficulties in life. He had been called a lot of derogatory names, and he had struggles with insecurity and, and uh, um, just how he viewed himself. And he, he was encouraged when he saw how how God saw potential in Gideon when Gideon didn't see potential in himself. And God raised up Gideon and made him something that Gideon never thought he could ever be. We've been studying through the book of Judges, and today we're starting kind of a mini-series within a series. We're going to talk about Gideon for the next three weeks. He's a major judge in this book, and so we got three chapters devoted to Gideon. Today we're just going to talk about Judges chapter 6, Gideon the Mighty Warrior. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Judges chapter 6. In the first part of this chapter, we see some important background information that kind of sets the stage for our story. In verses 1 through 3, it says, Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, in caves, and in strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. The chapter begins with a phrase we see repeated often in the book of Judges. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We see this cycle of sin taking place over and over again in the book of Judges. And here it is again. The cycle begins. They, they're enjoying a time of rest. They're enjoying prosperity and protection from God. But then they forget about Yahweh, the one true God, and they start worshiping the false gods of the Canaanites. And so God removes his protection, and he allows the surrounding nations to come in and oppress the people of Israel. The Midianites were a nomadic people living southeast of the Dead Sea. However, during the time of the judges, they traveled north to plunder the land of Israel. In your bulletin, there's some sermon notes, and on the back page, there's a map there that can show you where, where these Midianites came from. Uh, Moses actually lived with the Midianites for a while. He, he lived there for 40 years when he fled uh, Egypt, after he killed the Egyptian, he went and lived with the Midianites and married um, a, a daughter of the priest of the Midianites. And so they, they were at one time on good terms, on friendly terms, but now things are different. And Judges 6, 4 through 6 goes on to say, they camped on the land and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and they did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. This was an enormous band of invaders 
Later in chapter 8, we'll see that the Midianites had at least 135,000 soldiers in their army. That's in addition to all the, the women and children and, and, and all their livestock. This massive invasion of, of all these people and their livestock coming into an area that was relatively small. Israel was about 80 miles long and about 40 miles wide. You thought a caravan of 5,000 people was a lot? Imagine 135,000 plus all their wives, all their children, all their livestock coming not just to our nation, not just to our state, but just to a small section, say the I-5 corridor from Vancouver to Centralia, about 80 miles and about 40 miles wide, all camping all along I-5. That's what Israel was dealing with in Judges chapter 6. And we see the next two stages of this cycle of sin. Israel cries out to the Lord for help, and God raises up a judge to deliver them. And we saw in previous chapters how, how God would raise up people to lead that we would never expect to be leaders. And it, there's no exception in this chapter. Uh, Gideon is not the guy that we would have picked to be the leader, to be this mighty warrior that God calls him to be. Even Gideon had a hard time believing that God was calling him. Gideon saw himself as the most insignificant person in his family. He saw his family as the most insignificant family in his tribe. How, how could God choose Gideon? Why would God choose Gideon to do anything important? And Gideon struggled with feelings of insecurity. But you know, Gideon's humility is probably one of the main reasons why God chose him. And it's also one of the reasons why God will choose us to do great things. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? He said, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And so God chose Gideon. Do you ever struggle with feelings of insignificance, insecurity? Like, why would God ever choose me? Why, how could God ever use me? Well, I want you to remember that regardless of your past, regardless of your reputation, regardless of how insignificant you feel, if you're a Christian, God has already chosen you. He's chosen you to accomplish great things, things that will last for all eternity, for His glory. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, He can accomplish great things through all of us. As Christians, God has not just called us to be good, He's called us to be great. And as children of God, we are great. So how do we overcome our insecurities? How can we rise up and be the people that God is calling us to be? That's really the question I want to probe today as we look at the life of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And I see uh, the, the first way, the thir first thing we need to do to, to rise up and be the people God wants us to be is, is to do exactly what we see here in Judges 6, that is pay attention to God's affirmations. See, an affirmation is a statement that God makes about His people, that God makes about us. And we see many passages in Scripture where God tells us who we are. God speaks to us and tells us who He has created us to be, that He's created us not just to be average, not to be mediocre, not to be even just good, but He's created us to be great. He's created us to be the very image of His Son. Look at the affirmation that God makes to Gideon when He calls him. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The angel of the Lord is probably a physical manifestation of God himself. That's a common phrase, the angel of the Lord, referring to the pre-incarnate Christ. 
coming and speaking to his people. And so the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And that's kind of funny in and of itself when you think about the picture here. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. And he's doing that because he's afraid of the Midianites. He's afraid that if the Midianites know that he has some wheat, they're going to come and steal it from him. Uh, th threshing wheat, that's, that's a process by which you separate the chaff from the kernel. Uh, all wheat, it's, it's a kernel that is good to eat, covered with kind of this paper substance that's not that good to eat. And so farmers would, would roll a heavy stone over the wheat to, to break that outer husk, and then they'd take a shovel or a pitchfork, and on a windy day, they'd take a scoop, throw it up in the air, and the, the wind would blow the chaff away, and the kernel would fall down. Well, there's a problem. In, in a wine press, there's not a lot of wind. Okay? You think, you think about this, this big uh, cylindrical room where they'd put a bunch of grapes and stomp on the grapes to make wine. Well, it, it's, it's got walls all the way around. So here's Gideon. Maybe, you know, if you're looking from the outside, you can see the top of his head peeking out over the, the walls of the wine press, and every once in a while a shovel coming up. He's got to throw that grain up above the walls of the wine press in order for the wind to blow the chaff away. And he's doing all that extra work because he's afraid of the Midianites. He doesn't see himself as a mighty warrior. He sees himself as a cowardly farmer. And even in his response, Gideon completely ignores what the Lord said about him. He ignores the Lord's affirmation. And then he accuses God of abandoning Israel. Look what he says in verse 13. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Did not the Lord, uh, what, but now why has the Lord abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian? He's, he's blaming the problems that they're facing on the Lord. When, you know, when we go through problems, when we're going through difficulties in life, we need to recognize that it's not God's fault. We need to recognize that God has not abandoned us that God is still with us. He has a purpose for everything that's taking place in our lives. When we're going through difficult times, we need to listen to what God says about us and recognize that He loves us, He has saved us, He has adopted us as His children, and He's called us to be great. Listen to what God says about all Christians in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter is writing to Christians who are suffering severe persecution, and this is what he says. This is what God says about you. You are a great people. You are God's people. You're a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation. Live up to what God created you to be, regardless of what people are saying about you or doing to you. Don't let the world determine your identity. Listen to the affirmations of God. That's how we become what God has called us to be. We also need to go in the strength of God's commission. God has a purpose and a plan for each of us as Christians. He has called us. He's given us a general calling to do exactly what we saw in 1 Peter 2, to declare the praises of Him who's called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. And we also have the great commission as, as disciples of Christ. God has called us to preach the gospel. God has called us to make disciples of all the nations. But you know, as individuals, God also has a specific plan for us. He's given us each different experiences in life, talents, gifts, abilities, and based on the opportunities we have, we have a special calling, a specific calling. And that calling gives us a sense of purpose and fulfillment in life. God will always give us the strength we need to carry out the calling that He's given to us. Look at what God told Gideon. In Judges 6, 14 through 16, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have. 
Save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Notice the strength comes from the very call that he gives them. I'm sending you. That's the strength you have. But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. The Lord said, I will be with you. There's another source of strength. I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. You see, our strength does not come from our genetics. Our strength doesn't come from our DNA. It doesn't come from our background. It doesn't come from the people in our culture. It doesn't come from what people say about us. It comes from God himself. And this statement, I will be with you, the very presence of God, that's a powerful promise that God often gives to people when he's giving them a task to accomplish, when he gives them a calling or a commission. He often says, I will be with you. He said it to Moses at the burning bush when he called Moses. He said, I will be with you. He said it to Joshua when Joshua took the Israelites into the land of promise. He said, I will be with you. And now, after they're in the land of promise, he raises up this judge and he says, I will be with you. God also says it to us. In the Great Commission, when Jesus told us to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, when he told us to make disciples of all the nations, he said that he would be with us. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The end of the age hasn't happened yet. Okay. This promise still stands. Jesus is with us to help us carry out this great commission. This commission, this calling, gives us purpose and fulfillment. It makes us who God has called us to be. It gives us the strength to be what God has called us to be. And His presence, that promise of God's presence, is strength to be what God has called us to be. How can we be the people God has called us to be? Well, we also need to confirm our faith by remembering God's actions. Gideon was a man who was constantly struggling with doubts and fears and feelings of insecurity. He was constantly asking God for signs to strengthen his faith. He was like that that father of the demon-possessed boy who said, "I, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Look at what Gideon says in verse 17. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'll wait until you return. You know, it's encouraging to me to see God working through people like Gideon. To know that that God works through people who are struggling with doubts. God accomplishes great things through people who are not these super Christians with perfect faith. There are no super Christians with perfect faith. God knows when our faith needs a boost. He also knows when our faith needs to be challenged and stretched. Gideon wanted to be certain that this really is the Lord that is giving him these instructions. So he goes to get an offering to present to the Lord. And when Gideon returns with uh, the meat of a young goat and some unleavened bread, the angel of the Lord touches the offering and, and he touches it with the staff and instantly the whole offering just is consumed in fire and burns up. And Gideon knew that this was the Lord and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. His doubts evaporated, vanished along with the angel of the Lord. And he knew this really is the Lord speaking to me. But it wasn't the end of his struggle with doubt and fear. We see that throughout chapters 6, 7, and 8, he continues to have these struggles. And so will we. We see later in this chapter, in the passage about the fleece, Gideon wants to know for certain, is this plan going to work? This this doesn't seem like it's a good plan, God. Uh, I need some reassurance here. And so he, 
he sets a fleece out and he says, God, if it's, if it's really going to work, if it's really going to work, you know, uh, make this fleece dry and all the ground around it wet. You know, um, and, uh, that was actually the second one. The first time he says, make the fleece wet and all the ground dry. And he does these signs asking God to show him that his word is true. And God is patient with him. He knows Gideon has a struggle believing what he's telling him. He patiently gives him those, those signs to boost his faith. But you know, asking for a sign is really not the way God wants us to strengthen and confirm our faith. God wants us to strengthen and confirm our faith by remembering what he's already done for us. He wants us to base, base our faith on the actions that he has already performed. God has a perfect track record of faithfulness. If we intentionally remember and tell people about the great things God has done for us, our faith is going to be strong enough that we don't have to ask for signs. We'll be looking at dozens of signs that have already happened throughout our life. In the cycle of sin that we see in Judges, I mentioned that they start with this period of rest and then they go into this time of rebellion and then they cry out for help and God brings a deliverer. Usually when they cry out for help, God brings a judge, a deliverer to rescue them. But in this case, God added another step in this cycle. He initially did not bring a judge when they cried out for help. Instead of bringing a judge, he brought a prophet. Go back to Judges 6, verses 7 through 10, and, and we see that God brings a prophet to remind them of what God had already done. In Judges 6, 7 through 10, it says, When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet, not a judge, he sent them a prophet, who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you've not listened to me. God sent them a prophet to remind them of the faithful actions of God. The signs that he had already given them. And, and specifically, deliverance from bondage in Egypt. The Exodus event is referred to in Scripture more than any other event. After the book of Exodus, just in the Old Testament alone, the Exodus event is referred to 120 times. Over and over again, God was commanding his people, don't forget that. Remember your deliverance from Egypt. Remember my actions of saving you and delivering you. Remember those faithful signs that I gave you that I am your deliverer. The Exodus event is the gospel of the Old Testament. It is their message of salvation. The reason Israel kept falling back into idolatry is because they lost their love for the gospel. They stopped remembering how God had saved them. They no longer enthusiastically told the story of their deliverance to their children and their grandchildren. They stopped singing with joy the song of Moses. They stopped celebrating the Passover with passion. And they lost their love for the gospel. And as a result, they lost their faith in Yahweh and fell back into idolatry. What about us? Have we lost our love for the gospel? We need to strengthen and confirm our faith by remembering those actions Jesus went through for us when he went to the cross. We need to maintain our love for the gospel. We need to tell the story of the gospel enthusiastically to our children, our grandchildren, and anyone who will hear we need to sing the songs of the gospel with joy. And we need to celebrate the Lord's Supper with passion, remembering what Jesus has done for us. That's how we become what God has called us to be. The gospel is powerful. 
And we need to remember those saving actions of Jesus on our behalf. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. How can we be the people God has called us to be? Well, we need to find peace by following God's instructions. Look at what Gideon did right after he realized that he was talking to the Lord. In Judges 6.22, it says, When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abizrites. Gideon was afraid that, that because he had this encounter with God, that that was the end. He was going to die. And he was afraid of, of a lot of things in life, but he found peace. He found assurance from the, from the Word of God, and he continued to find peace by following God's Word. Look at what God tells Gideon to do right after this. In verse 25, the same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, Remember, they had been in bondage from the Midianites for seven years. This bull that's seven years old is a symbol of Midianite oppression. He says, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Isn't that interesting? He, he set up an altar after he realized he's talking to the Lord. He sets up an altar and offers a, a, a sacrifice to the Lord. But right next to it, there, there's already another altar to Baal. You see, when the Israelites cried out for deliverance, it was not a cry of repentance. There was still idolatry that they were holding on to, even in Gideon's own family. And so God tells them, okay, I, 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 I'm thankful that you built an altar to me. Now I want you to build the right kind of altar to me. And I want you to tear down that other one because I don't share my worship with anyone. And then build a proper kind of altar, he says, to the Lord your God on top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down after the second bull, as a, offer the se second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Okay, so he was, he was fighting against the flow. He was going against the flow. He knew that the culture around him, his Israelite culture, was a Baal-worshipping culture, even in his own family. He was afraid of what his own people would do to him, not just what the Midianites would do. When the Israelites cried out to God, it was not a cry of repentance, it was a cry of, take this struggle away from us and let us hold on to our idolatry. Sometimes when God calls us, we'll have to confront idolatry even among our loved ones, even in our own families. And we're going to have to overcome our fears just like Gideon did. In verse 28, it goes on to say, In the morning when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, with the Asherah pole beside it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And they asked each other, Who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. One of those ten men had loose lips. The men of the town demanded Joash. Bring out your son. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is God, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So that day they called Gideon Jerob Baal saying, let Baal contend with him, because he broke down Baal's altar. Gideon is still struggling with doubt and fear, but because he had the courage to take action, 
to follow the instructions of the Lord, God used that to convert his father to worship Yahweh and Yahweh only and even be an influence on the community around him. We're going to be Yahweh worshipers now and we're not going to worship Baal anymore. God called Gideon to be a mighty warrior to defeat the Midianites, but his first battle was against doubt and against fear and against idolatry in his culture. God called Gideon to be a mighty warrior spiritually. And God led him through those battles, and God would continue to lead Gideon through the battles that were yet to come. Look at verse 33. Now all the Midianites and Amalekites and other eastern people joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. We saw the Spirit of the Lord come upon another judge back in chapter 3. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and he judged the people. And the word here for came upon actually means to be clothed in. Gideon was clothed in the Spirit of the Lord. That reminds me of what Paul said about Christian baptism in Galatians 3.27. He says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, and and that's what God did to Gideon. He, He clothed Gideon with the Spirit of God. Ultimately, the only way that we can be all that God wants us to be is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God has given us specific instructions so that we can be all that he wants us to be. And and, and that means that we need to put our faith in Christ. We need to turn away from our sins. And yes, we need to be baptized into Christ. That's when we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are clothed with Christ. What about you? Have you followed God's instructions? There is peace in following God's instructions. And if you have not done that, if you've not put your faith in Christ and been baptized into Christ, why not today? Why not experience the peace of God today? And if you have, you are a Christian. You are called by God, not just to be good, but to be great. Are you living according to this calling that God has given to you? Are you living a life worthy of the calling that God has given to you? This time, I'd like to have the praise team come and prepare to lead us in a closing song. And as they do that, think about the calling that God has given to you. Think about what God has called you to be. Are are you being that person that God has called you to be? And how can you be that person this week? Pay attention to God's affirmations. What is God saying about you? Uh, Go in the strength of God's commission. Recognize that your strength comes from God and not from what the people around you are saying. Confirm your faith by remembering God's actions, especially what Christ has done for us at the cross. And find peace by following God's instructions. At this time, let's stand and we'll have a prayer. And then after we pray, we'll sing one more song. God, we are so thankful that you have called us and that that you have given us a commission that that gives us strength and purpose and fulfillment in life. God, we know that we are imperfect. We are constantly struggling with doubts and fears and insecurities. But God, it's so good to know that none of those things matter, regardless of our past, regardless of our reputation, regardless of what people say about us. You have called us to accomplish great things that will last for all eternity. And God, I just pray that you'd help us to live lives that are worthy of the gospel and bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.